With that, I now look to Andrew Gilmore to close the case for the proposition. Thank you very much, um, Madam President. Last time I was in this chamber was 35 years ago, and I was the proposing the motion at the time. And I was struck by the fact that all four officials of the union felt the need to come and, and oppose. Now, the, the first up was the secretary um, who gave the, the listed speaker, and there the similarities end, because he, at the time, he had shockingly blonde, unruly hair. He was Eton and Balliol, thank you for outing me. Um, he was taking a night off from the Bullingdon, I think, and uh, his speech, although it was an extremely important subject, Middle East peace, was remarkably short of substance, but quite long on jokes. And he is going to go down in history for his opposition, not to the UN, but to the EU. The, that was the first one. The next was the librarian. I'm afraid I've entirely forgotten both him and his speech. Um, no, not all librarians are equally forgettable, but uh, that one was, I have no idea who he was or what he said. Um, but I, even more shocking, though, was the fact that the president broke the precedent of um, a convention of centuries, I don't know, and came down from his perch and uh, spoke very aggressively in opposition. Now, I was going to ask you, Madam president, president, not to behave in the same way, but then I actually realized I didn't really mind if you did, because I'm not quite sure what I'm doing on this side of the house. <laughs> and, I, and I need to explain that. I mean, the office, officials know, because I pointed out that when I was kindly invited to come and speak here, um, I pointed out that I'm obviously to totally against the spirit of the motion, but actually the way it's drafted, I don't have a problem with. So I had a choice, or I gave them the choice. Do you want me to speak in favor of the letter of the motion, but opposed to the spirit, or opposing the motion, but saying that the letter is okay, and you chose that I should be on this side. And um, I think my assumption of that the spirit was deeply hostile to the UN was borne out by the fact that I then learned that my partner was supposed to be a very far right-wing Israeli ambassador to the UN, who I knew, I should know him, was going to come and drop, drip scorn and condescension on the whole concept of the UN on international law and human rights. And I was actually looking forward to some fratricidal strife from this side of the house, and I was getting ready to, to actually attack him. But then I, I learned that he pulled out of it and to be replaced by my old friend and a very, very distinguished, brilliant, and principled for Macaulay, Charles. So that, that changed the calculation a little bit. But I do, I do need to explain why, uh, why, why that was the case. So what, how can I oppose the spirit by being in favor of the letter? Because the answer is that the motion says almost nothing at all. And I mean, it, it says, I mean, it's actually quite remarkable how vacuous it is. Because all we are essentially, yes, does the UN create an image of global cooperation? Well, of course it bloody does. That is its raison d'etre. <laughs> is sometimes that image a little bit illusory because it goes beyond the gritty realities of the world? Well, yes, it is. So that is all we have to prove tonight. And you have a lot harder burden, I have to say, you guys. We do not have to, the motion is not, is the UN a magnificent thing? Which, by the way, I think it is. Uh, the librarian clearly, clearly doesn't. But it's not, does the UN need reform? Yes, it does. It's not, is the UN, does it fail sometimes? Yes, it does. It's not even, does the UN always create an illusion? It's not even, is the UN merely create an illusion? No, none of that. It is just what I said it is. It, it is every now and then, it goes a little bit far, but it does create an image of cooperation. And I would even go further than that as to say that it's actually a positive good that it creates, it goes beyond reality and creates an illusion. I'd like to take you back to 1944. The Battle of Arnhem is raging. Churchill, as so often, is thinking of the post-war settlement. And he uh, meets his, his chiefs of staff, and an admiral suggests to him that maybe Churchill's idea of a United Nations after the war is a little bit naive. Churchill firmly rejects that and says, it is the only hope for mankind. And so even after the worst war in history, genocide and massive destruction, you find the ultimate realists understanding that after the war, you're going to need something 
and it's a necessity even to have something that prevents future massive war and promotes peace, democracy, and uh, development and human rights. Afterwards, we have the Cold War very, very quickly. And it, it, it descends, as the last speaker says, it, the Security Council and the UN as a whole descends partly into paralysis. And it's only a few years later that, as Mark Lagrange has quoted, that the great Secretary General, like Hammarskjöld, said, the UN, this is a very important point, it is not created to take men to heaven, but to prevent us going to hell. And that it sounds like a low goal, but actually it's a very noble one, and one that the UN, frankly, has met over 75 years. It has been hell in many countries where war descended, but in terms of a, a global world war, it has prevented that happening. And indeed, th there was a, uh, an Irish thinker and diplomat, Conor Cruz O'Brien, wrote a book called United Nations Drama. Um, this, oh, I've forgotten his title now. Um, and it, 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 it's I talked about how the UN is it's a, a form of theater where leaders can come and posture and let off steam and it's occasionally devise rituals that save the peace, partly by saving the face of, the, of, of, people, of, of powerful people. And a great example was the year of Mark Lyle Grant's birth, 1956, I will tell you. It was uh, the, the year of the Eisenhower administration had been pushing the Eastern Europeans to revolt against the Soviet Union. And the Hungarians took them at their word that actually they will be helped. Well, at which point, the Americans realized that if they went in to help the Hungarians when the Soviet tanks rolled in, which, by the way, led to the master of my college, Balliol, uh, resigning from the Communist Party in protest, that they realized that were that to happen, that would lead to world war. So what did the Americans do? They said, oh, let's take you to the UN, where, sure enough, everybody piled in and condemned what was going on while the Soviets were busily, brutally repressing the regime, the revolters. And uh, whereupon the Americans said, oh God, the UN uh, is failing to, to confront. But so what, confront Soviet aggression. But by doing so, and this is awful for the Hungarians, they threw the Hungarians under the bus, but they prevented war. And they instead, they blamed the UN, which is so easy to do uh, in, in terms of how um, for, for, for failing to do what member states didn't want to happen. Blaming the UN is so easy. And indeed, a former American ambassador, Richard Holbrook, once said, but blaming the UN for the world's disagreements is like blaming Madison Square Gardens when the New York Knicks play badly. And, but the very fact that the UN does get blamed, um, I think does show that the UN somehow to its detriment, succeeds in providing, in projecting an illusion that it is more powerful than it is in being able to prevent this. Now, there are two people, two sets of people who criticize the UN uh, for failing to, uh, to impose peace. There are those who genuinely wanted to impose peace and wish it was more powerful, and that it had the means to impose a global cooperation that trumped a uh, selfish, narrow selfishness. But then there are also those who are more cynical and I would suggest that our absent Israeli friend might be in that category, more like the, the sort of the arsonist who, who sets a fire alight, stokes it for years, prevents the fire brigade from arriving on the scene, and then excoriates it when it does. And uh, it's very easy to criticize the UN. And I, we actually had a great example tonight, and we heard it from my colleague, the librarian. I mean, this is great. Uh, you guys invited all males and then say the UN has a gender problem. Uh, <laughs> that, that is vintage criticism of the UN. Thank you. And uh, so we plead guilty of many things, perhaps not that. So the fact that the UN, there are standards, and where would the UN be? Where, where would the world be if there wasn't some ability of to project an idea of cooperation and of standards and of human rights and law. And we all know um, that, that in, I mean, member states, however repressive and aggressive they are, they actually hate being called out by the UN. We've all done it. We've seen um, Edward Mortimer, who I think was meant to be here today, when, when the, Kofi Annan said that the war in Iraq was illegal, how the Americans reacted, how Zaid has had a response when we've criticized Sisi, Netanyahu, Erdogan, Modi, 
the, the lot, uh, people mined desperately, and it, they would behave even worse if there wasn't the possibility that somehow they would be called out. So even if there's an illusion created, which I think it is, it is not a bad thing. So clearly, this is not a debate for or against the UN. And I mean, Charles, Peter, and I, between us, have uh, 50 years of experience on the front lines of virtually every single international crisis in the last quarter century. And the opposition's arguments are frankly excellent, and I haven't disagreed with a single point. <laughs> and even if I can say that based on the funny wording, I, I'm on this side of the house. So, to, but I do believe it would be a mistake in this age, let us face it, of catastrophic global warming, of Brexit, of coronavirus, of Trumpsterism. I would be frankly appalled if this great institution were to somehow send a signal that in, in the face of all these problems that the Oxford Union believed that now was the right time to undermine the United Nations, to kick away the crucial crutch of global, global, global cooperation and to repudiate Churchill's only hope. So that is why I proudly propose the resolution, but I humbly suggest to members that you abstain. <laughs>